it seems ages ago since I was first contacted about this. And uh, what's strange is that we've had a pandemic in between that and uh, I've been doing research and my ideas have been changing a lot uh, over that period. So they are very fluent, fluid, changeable, and the opinions I'm going to present to you now are those of somebody grappling with a problem. My problem is this. Um, some people get paid, others don't. And I don't care what terms you use for the field, but my thinking at the moment is around the simple variable, who gets paid and who doesn't. And the variable means money. Uh, so I have suggested that the field might be called voluntary translation, but that's just a suggestion. I don't care what terms people use as long as they're clear, and I'm trying to be clear. Some people get paid for doing this, others don't. But the others do get paid. Uh, they get paid, and here you'll be familiar with uh, Bourdieu's categories of social capitals or different kinds of capitals. They get paid in prestige. They get paid in social contacts, social networks. They get knowledge and they get experience, and this can be useful. And uh, those are Bourdieu's capitals, if you like, and they can all be exchanged with each other as we play this game of progressing in societies. So uh, the fact that people don't get paid money uh, implies that they get paid in other ways or have other ways of doing it. And that's of interest to me, that diversity of motivations. And I would add to Bourdieu, since he didn't talk about cooperation, that there are cooperative relations, very asymmetrical, often involving dependence in the case of intergenerational relations. But those are also part of the motivations for what we pick up. And happiness, which Bourdieu also left out. Uh, not just altruism, but there is a sort of well-being in this. And my son, when he uh, talked about this, I said, well, how was it? He said, yeah, it was good because I could help the people there. And, and it was the only occasion where it was a real advantage uh, to have, have the other language uh, that he got a bit of bullying for in any case. Uh, there's no reason to idealize kids or the society that they form at school they represent the best and the worst of their adult societies. All right, uh, that's what I'm interested in, those kinds of motivations, and particularly the fact that uh, if you apply Bourdieu, uh, a gain in any one of these capitals can be exchanged for any of the others, potentially, and that exchange happens over time. This is where trust comes in. Uh, trust means that I will do this now and you will pay me money later on. That's a trust relationship. But also, if I do this well or we train you to do it well, this will bring about rewards somewhere else in the network of exchange capitals. And in order for that to happen, we have to trust that it can happen. Trust for me is not a uh, simple confidence in repeated uh, ability. Uh, trust involves the risk of betrayal. I take uh, that my notion of trust from Luhmann, um, as you will see later on in the piece. Uh, it can be betrayed. It is associated with risk, uh, therefore. Now, my problem, that's to set the scene and the, the topics that I'm interested in, to set the scene. I, uh, I'm a translation scholar, basically. And if I have to tell my mom what I do, that's good for the world. I, I train translators. That's my basic activity. I train translators. And as such, I, I have been engaged for many, many, many years in the training of professional translators and in the idea that we are helping to form a better profession. And this has been a very strong um, ideological motivation for, for scholarship, not just myself, but many of us here today have been involved in that. So I pick up this model from uh, Joseph Tseng, um, where you can see that we move from market disorder, 
when there is chaos in the world of translation and nobody knows what a good translation is, nobody knows how or, or how much to get paid. Uh, and we find this map of how to get through to the nirvana of protection and licensure, uh, that is the formation of what might be uh, one of the uh, liberal professions like, like lawyers and doctors and architects and etc. And what interests me in this diagram, I actually, I, I went to find this guy's master's thesis in, in, in the university in Taipei. Uh, I've since republished it and it was done later revised by June 2009. What's interesting is that I'm in the training institutions. And if you can see there, they have three different roles. It's the first step out of market disorder but it's also after you get some consensus and commitment among the players in this game, it's a contributor to professional associations. And then it reappears down here where the institutions are based on certification and academization, as it's called. It's getting capitals in from the education system, but also from the formation of an association right in the middle there and certification down here. Government is playing its role over here. That, that's a really interesting map. And that really motivated me for quite a long time. We were moving towards that. So even when I was doing translation history, I would be looking for antecedents for the identities of intercultural mediators in a professional frame. There was at that time, a kind of implicit pact, I suggest, between academics and professionals, that we are helping the professionals develop their profession and, and get it to a better place. And the professionals would sometimes therefore uh, allow themselves to be studied by us. Mostly though, they just said we were useless theorists who didn't know anything about the practical realities. Let's not kid ourselves. However, the motivation worked for me to the extent that I worked on this European project on the status of the translation profession and paid a lot of attention to the role of certification. And this was part of moves towards a European uh, translation certification system, which has not yet happened, I note in passing. Now, to do all of that, oh, sorry, um, we were ideologically uh, trained not to see the people who were not being paid. In fact, they would be a threat to this mission to constitute um, an accredited liberal profession. Now, this is hot off the press from Beijing, uh, the uh, Beijing, Beijing School of Foreign Studies. Uh, and uh, Bei, who has translated this for me, you've got the Chinese over here. This is a, a, a plan rather like the previous one, but it's to measure the translation capacity of a particular country. And you can see the components you've got here, the main ones, and then broken down here and broken down here. And these are all the things that a country should have in order to have an adequate translation capacity. Interesting, isn't it? And China uh, measures itself on this. And uh, this grid has been applied to other countries. And we learn, for example, that China is number three in the world, and therefore needs government funds to catch up. It's a very useful little plan, this one. Um, I am not involved with this in any way. Okay. Uh, now, I'm interested that in order to develop your national capacity for translation, you've got very good things like, you know, emergency translation service management is absolutely essential. And we've got the training down here, the language is in the training, and we've got research as contributing to this national identity um, endeavor, this formation of, of, of a translation capacity in the country to handle, to handle what? We don't quite know, but it's there and can be measured. Now, what's missing? 
what's missing in the Chinese model, surprisingly, although it may be hidden, I, I hesitate to criticize without having investigated beyond level three, the elements of civil society, that is associations, even though China has many uh, professional associations and one very, very big one, the biggest in the world, the TAC, the speakers of foreign language who are not professionals in the society, the capacity of the general populace to speak foreign languages is not being measured. Indeed, nothing corresponding to what we would call mediation if we were following the common European framework reference. And I will come back to that at the end of this talk, I think. I'll just leave it there as uh, this model being a model of what can be achieved through government intervention and control, leaving out what we might think are the paraprofessional or non-professional elements that could contribute to a translation capacity in a society. China does it. I just pick up a point here, the Shanghai Expo 2010, uh, an army of 600 volunteers going around pick, fixing up all the bad translations. So there, there is voluntary activity there. It's just not in that particular um, uh, vision of, of what we should be doing. And um, I, I remember working on the Barcelona Olympic Games as well. We had volunteers there. Uh, our English students and, and translation students were all volunteers participating in uh, the capacity of Barcelona to, to organize the Olympic Games. And it worked really well. It was one of the most wonderful events of certainly of my life, uh, although I was working as a translator and not a volunteer there. Okay, so it happens, but it's not in the, the vision uh, that we have in that particular model. It's all over the place. So I'll just pick up a few debates um, around here. Perhaps I'll go a little faster. Uh, this was a call for the Catalan television to have volunteers work on the subtitling of its programs or some programs into Spanish, English, Arabic and Amazigh for the Berber speaking Berber range of, of, of languages. And uh, that was um, apparently laudable. It was importantly based on machine translation and then post editing and then professional correction of the post editing. But even then, uh, the professional organization expressed its discontent and perplexity, um, thinking that, that this participative uh, and collaborative citizenship engagement would devaluate, uh, would not give due value to the work of professionals. Uh, we have here the signs of this conflict that touches me very personally. Why? I train people for a profession and we're starting to see the volunteers around us doing things that apparently go against the interests of the profession. Now, a few notes before I get to my own research in this. A few realities about what it means to be training professionals. Uh, professional translators and interpreters do much less than 1% of all the translating that is done by machine translation. So here's a Chinese model of what impact machine translation is likely to have on the profession. We see machine aided translation will continue here and the prestigious translators at the top apparently want to remain the same. But this is my model of the kind of future we are moving towards very rapidly. That if I only study professional translators and interpreters, I am just looking at the tip of this particular huge iceberg. And I think we have to know what's going on down here with machine translation, not just volunteer translation, but people using free machine translation. Uh, you see, my, ver my variable is who gets paid. It's deceptively free. Uh, a second bit of information I want to put out there is uh, a study I've done recently with a doctoral student uh, with uh, Yu Hao on um, 
how many of our graduates actually get jobs as professional translators and interpreters. And in all the statistics that I've been able to locate, that number is around a third at best. And that's worrying because we have to say, well, where do the others go? What are they doing with the skills we give them? If we are not training people for direct entry into a closed and protected profession, what's happening? And in that particular study, uh, this intrigued me. This is from Zurich, as you can see. And it's an interesting survey of graduate employment because they asked about the main jobs and you get to about 30%. But then the second jobs and you get a little bit more. But then the third jobs, the, third, the things that people do, the things that people do in the gig economy, et cetera, uh, or, or for pleasure. Uh, or as part of their voluntary activity and participation in civil society. We get to 95.2%. I mean, they're all doing it, but they're not doing it professionally or as their main job. And this, this is starting to, to, to tell us something, I think, that the division between getting paid and not getting paid, profession, non-profession, is really not clear cut at all. Let's move on to the, uh, the, the, the studies. I'm going to talk about two uh, research projects that I've been engaged in. They are not on uh, non-professional translating. It's, uh, this is a side aspect of it, uh, but it came up because the data is rich. And if the data is rich, things come up that you, didn't expect to find, and in this case, probably we didn't want to find it. MIME is Mobility and Inclusion in Multilingual Europe. It involved about 23 universities, so it's a very big project, and I was in charge of this work package on uh, mediation. And here are my wonderful colleagues in that. Many of you will recognize Nikkei Bokorn there uh, especially. And uh, our job was to look at particular situations. Uh, we looked at, um, I got it down there, I think immigration centers in Leipzig and Ljubljana, uh, as well as other places, other groups, other studies. We were looking at uh, the way uh, interlingual communication problems were solved by the use of a lingua franca, interpreters, translators, translation technologies, machine translation, and into comprehension and uh, language learning. And uh, you can see that these are all elements of the inclusive multilingualism that we were introduced to at the beginning of yesterday's session. So we're very much within that frame. And uh, we want, to, yeah, sorry, we also looked at Russian speakers in Southern Catalonia and Italian child adoption. So lots and lots of very different case studies to see uh, which of these solutions people actually used. Now we find that all solutions can be used and people don't stick to one. They tend to mix and match them according to the situation. And there were fairly clear criteria um, as to when one is more advantageous than the others, which you can read in our report in this special issue of language problems, and language planning. But what we found in the data was something we didn't particularly want to find, at least at the beginning of the project. So I'm citing here from uh, Nikki Pokorns and, and Yaka's uh, article on the Ljubljana Detention Center. Uh, well, when, for example, they found that uh, 11 of the 34 interviewees used ad hoc interpreters, friends, family members, volunteers, okay? And we have it's statements like this, you can see the speaker, uh, he doesn't need it because he uses English, so lingua franca is his main, uh, main solution, but then relying on friends who could do the mediation with Slovene if it was necessary. Now, this was worrying because part of the reasons we had for doing the project was to try to get more official funds for professional interpreters and more use of interpreters to get better quality mediation happening. And we're finding 
not only that the people tend not to use it, but that they don't want to. This reluctance to use professional interpreters, uh, not trusting them because of the language problems, but also an, a hindrance to their independence. Uh, and this is very important. It was only after doing this study that I was speaking with a colleague at Monash University, Jim Hlavach, and he, he was talking about similar studies he's done in Melbourne with the Macedonian community and the Iraqi community, well, in, in Sydney as well. And he said, well, yeah, often these people are from places where officials are, are never neutral. Officials are not to be trusted. Officials are basically spies from the government to tell if you're telling, to see if you're telling the truth or not. And that there was an implicit non-trust of anybody who was employed officially. Therefore, they would turn to friends and, uh, uh, and, and family members whom they would trust far more. So this hindrance to independence can be read in several different ways. For the same reason, I hasten to add, they use machine translation uh, before and after going to a doctor, for example, uh, to get the right words, but also to check on what's being said, uh, basically so as not have to trust an intermediary who was not uh, known to them. Uh, so our recommendations at the end had to be moderated a bit, and we'd say, well, you know, use paid interpreters for the high-risk situations, and those high-risk situations are typified by requiring trust, not only by the person speaking the minority language in this case, but also by the official authorities. If you want trust to work on both sides, then you've got to get the uh, you've got to turn to the uh, the paid interpreters. If if one side of trust is enough, you might just rely on the uh, non or unpaid interpreters. Uh, this is uh, similar to findings um, that have been published by Rena and, and Barbara. I'll leave that as it is. Uh, it, I, we didn't pursue that very much because we had other motivations, I guess. We were still attached to uh, enhancing the profession. Let me turn now to a study of cult uh, culturally and linguistically diverse, that's cult, that's what we use around here, cult communities. Uh, this is in Melbourne, uh, and this is ongoing. In fact, we're trying to get our first publication um, delivered this evening, believe it or not. And here's uh, my colleagues in this. It's led by John Hadjik, not by myself. Uh, Robin is from uh, Health Education, and Bay, you will have seen her name there. She has since gone to Singapore. Um, successful doctoral student who gets a good job, there you go. Now, we're looking at the uh, Chinese, Italian, and Greek communities in Melbourne, and we're looking at them as communities that mediate the official information published by the various governments in Australia, uh, getting to the end users, and particularly in, in the elderly uh, who are the most vulnerable or have been the most vulnerable uh, during the COVID academic, uh, epidemic. Oh. Uh, when we first contacted the Victorian Multicultural Commission, which sort of organizes all these associations, we got a list of, I have to move that, some 42, but there are a lot more as I will go, go into uh, at the moment. Uh, lots and lots of these associations. The, the fabric of civil society is, is incredibly rich around Melbourne. We have some 250 languages spoken at home. We have 32 different faiths and religions. Um, there are, there's a lot going on in this area. And uh, these uh, associations are incredibly important. We add to them um, sports organizations, church organizations, etc which I'll come to in a minute as well. Now, we were interviewing people from these associations, so we're not interviewing end users of the communication, and we were interested in trust, in, in whom they trust and who is trusted by them, and uh, some findings were very clear. 
The most obvious one here is that all of the associations first said they trust the official information given by the government, in this case, the government of Victoria. Uh, this is the state we live in. These are the people who handled the, uh, the pandemic response uh, in Melbourne. Uh, now, I hasten to add that all these associations actually receive funds or funds. They have to apply for funding for different projects uh, from the Multicultural Commission. So uh, they had a strong motivation to say they trusted the government because they depend on that same government for some of their, the, their support. All right. So I trust the government's information, even though I may not agree with it. And the Chinese community in particular was a very apt at comparing the situation in Australia with the situation in China and uh, just being aware that China had handled it and solved all these problems uh, far better and, and far quicker than the Australians were able to. And so there was implicit comparison going on. Uh, if feeding probable uh, uh, distrust in the official information, but the organization was there to say, no, we do trust it, and we are going to convey it to our members. Now, what was interesting here in the pandemic situation is that a lot of information had to get out very quickly, and it changed uh, very quickly as well. So there's a time lag and uh, not everything could be translated immediately. So we would get some multilingual versions done of the very important and uh, information with a long shelf life, but immediate announcements would come out in English. And then for the Chinese community, especially, WeChat would, um, would uh, give several different translations of it. And then the uh, associations would do their translation of it. So the end user was confronting a plurality of translations, um, all of them done by uh, non-professionals, all of them done on a volunteer basis. Uh, I hasten to add that it, this is the one community in which the elderly do use electro, do use social, they're all on WeChat. So this is, this was the one community where electronic communication did work effectively. Other complaints were that official translations were done by paid translators who are certified in Australia. They have to be if they work for the government, but they were put on English language websites. So if you didn't know English, you couldn't get to the translation. So often these uh, volunteer associations were picking up the hidden translations that were there and getting them to the end users uh, so that they had access. Along the way though, many of them, particularly in the Greek community, which was particularly hard hit in aged care with many deaths, uh, the people didn't understand. They said it was too technical, too complicated. And it's true, the texts were not very well written in terms of plain prose. And so the translations would be accompanied by explanations and often by oral discussions as well. Phone calls to the people who are worried, explaining exactly what was going on, rather than sending a written translation or even reading one out. Trust was very important and was established with the communities through many different media channels. And that's one of the key findings here, that these associations were very good at using all media channels, that is radio, uh, television. We have SBS, which is a special broadcasting service, which is for the uh, minority uh, languages and communities. Um, social media, especially, and for the elderly, when they had money, they would do physical mail drops uh, because that was how the people understood the communication if they had a bit of paper in their hand. But that was costly and there weren't enough funds to do very much of that. The claim of the people in the associations is that by repeating the action and being consistent, their trustworthiness increased. At the same time, during our long lockdown, which lasted 111 days, at the moment I'm in a short lockdown, which might last 14 days, 
we'll see. Uh, there were press reports about unreliable translations, mistranslated and outdated for migrant communities. And so there was growing public distrust in the official translators. Uh, and journalists pick this up. Once journalists get an idea, uh, they're going to reproduce it, uh, no matter what you tell them. Uh, the point of um, distrust, the, 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 the spark that set off this distrust, were two instances where uh, languages were mixed up. Okay, uh, so uh, Farsi and Urdu were put on a document as if they were the same language, and the same happened with uh, Bahasa Indonesia and and um, and Turkish, which is disastrous. Uh, that's like a, a plain insult to anybody speaking these languages. Hey, you know what? We care so little about your languages that we're just going to put them together with some other random language. Uh, the problem with trust is that it is hard to build up. We noticed the previous citation. Trust is built up over time with consistent multimedia, multi-platform uh, communication. And it can go like that when there is a very blatant, obvious error like this one. Trust is eroded and cooperation becomes more difficult and then the people turn to their communities, the volunteer communities, these associations, rather than trust the official information. And that turning also involves misinformation, uh, the infodemic, the conspiracy theories to which some of our communities were very open. Now, something's happened here in relation to this event. Um, I came out saying, look, I came out, I mean, in, in you know, television, radio, press um, interviews and, and a piece that I wrote as well, saying basically, look, this is a management problem. This is, is people uh, not doing the project management and not testing it before it gets out there. Translation it takes time and you have to do the testing. And that it's not a problem of translators. The translators are still qualified. The translators could be working pretty well, but this is a problem of, of, of management. Uh, to little avail, uh, this press campaign against translation, probably the most of that any of the Australian public ever heard about translation, uh, was successful in that it resulted in the Victorian government giving a lot more money uh, for translation services. So these journalists uh, can work to some good end occasionally. I'll, I'll finish now. I'll, I'll finish with a few reflections on, on how these associations work and why it's good to have uh, voluntary associations in a society. First, 250 languages, not even the Chinese government could organize that centrally and rationally so far. Okay, uh, the existence of civil society with volunteers enables complex decisions to be handled or complex problems to be handled locally. They create what's called a, an economy of trust within the society and it's based on what Putnam called thick trust, knowing the person, knowing the people, knowing them like you. And to Putnam, we would add political parties, trades unions, religious organizations, as opposed to the thin trust, which is this is a translation because the translator is qualified or certified uh, by, by the National Association. Do we know anything else about the translator? No. Uh, for the profession, that should be enough. But the existence of this thick trust in society is seen as a virtue for civil society and the functioning of democracies. It tends to be associated with low trust in government. Uh, China, I cited the example previously, has a very high level of trust in government and therefore perhaps does not need this network of civil society and of voluntary associations. 
Australia has a very low level of trust in government and we need it and we have it. What we can learn from this for general translation, I think is that uh, a model of translation, which is based on thin trust on no more than certification of the person and the delivery of a product is inadequate for effective communication, at least on the level of changing behavior. What the Victorian government did with that money was invest in people going and talking with people, as you can see here. Uh, the reception of translation for me, if it's to be effective, is ideally a conversation. And the volunteers, the volunteers in the associations, or the volunteers, be it my son at his school in Catalonia, those volunteers can ensure comprehension by engaging in a conversation. Whereas our traditional model of translation and interpreting the delivery of a text cannot promise to do that. To that extent, I think we have a lot to learn. We, all the people engaged with translation and interpreting, training, professional or unprofessional, I think non-professional, I think we all have a lot potentially to learn from the work of volunteer translators and interpreters. I thank you for your attention.